Uh, my name is Dina Romero and I'm the leader of Bath and North East Somerset Council and I'll be joined today by Councillor Sarah Warren, who is our Cabinet Member for the Climate Emergency, and also Jane Wildblood, who is our Lead Officer on the Council for Climate Emergency and the Renewal Vision Workstream. So in March 2019, the Council declared a climate emergency and since the local elections in 2019, when the Lib Dems won most of the seats, this council has been working on how we will be addressing the climate emergency. So one of the first things that I did uh, was to create a new post on our cabinet and to actually have a cabinet member who would have responsibility for the climate emergency. So I would now like to invite Councillor Sarah Warren, who is the cabinet member for climate emergency, to give a recap of where we are now and also to share some of the conversations that she's been having with a variety of groups during the um, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Thank you Dina. Um, it's obviously been an incredible year for me, actually, as a new councillor. It's been an incredibly steep learning curve um, and we've been working very, very hard. So we've been working really closely with um, lots of our partners from around the city, the other public sector organisations and some of the um, larger businesses and so on. Um, and we've been working with them. Lots of those public sector organisations in particular have declared a climate emergency themselves now. We've been working with um, schools who have uh, put together a climate network in their own right um, and behind the scenes we've been working very hard at beginning to incorporate the climate emergency into transport and planning policy um, so that's a very long slow process often frustratingly actually long and slow but we are working very hard to begin that process um, we've done some smaller and more practical, um, take some smaller and more practical measures that you might have seen, such as we've been working with some of our shops to reduce um, uh, um, single use plastics. We've been working. Um, um, so then in terms of communications, we have been out to the Northeast Somerset has a number of community forums that are meetings that the council organises. Um, with lots of the parishes and so I've been out with my colleague Jane Wildblood and we've um, spoken in lots of those forums so we're engaging with the public all the time and back in March um, just when coronavirus hit we were actually working towards a big event that we were going to have in the Guildhall um, a really big launch event we planned to take it over for the whole day and have all kinds of conversations um, the idea was that it would be very much um, uh, we would have presentations but that a lot of it would be um, led by the public that they would have the opportunity to have their say so sadly that had to be cancelled like everything else and since then of course we've all been on a journey actually coronavirus has changed so much about all of our lives um, and it has changed the way that we interact with our environment and the way in which we emit carbon so um, it's given us all a lot to think about I think um, anyway, with the cancellation of that event, um, well, that was obviously initially quite frustrating. And then, of course, lots of people, uh, the public, everyone had had other things on their minds, had coronavirus. But in the end, with um, a couple of colleagues, uh, we thought we would try to revive some parts of what would have gone on in the Guildhall. And so we set up some webinar conversations um, and they um, they were really 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 good fun actually so these were people who we had hoped would have come and spoken at the guild hall they um are people from around the community who um had each in their own right had picked one area of of activity that relates to climate and nature emergency and had decided that was their area and had just just sort of off their own back really just got going and done some work in that area um, and I found them really inspiring, actually, because some of what they'd done was really impressive and quite awe-inspiring, even. Um, so I spoke with Donald McIntyre, who's a local farmer who um, uh, farms wildflower meadows and sells seed. Um, and he'd set that up um, decades ago. But um, of course, now it's really come into its own and people are really interested. I spoke with some 15-year-old school strikers 
um, again, incredible at that age that they're organizing their peers and, and that they're taking on so much. I spoke with um, John Adler from Freshford Parish Council, and that's a very proactive council, and they've taken a huge number of um, measures uh, and initiatives. Um, and it's all about their community pulling together. Um, I spoke with Lorna Montgomery from Bath Share and Repair, who's tackling overconsumption through the rebellious act of repairing and sharing. Um, Adam Gretton from More Trees for Baines, who's, who's engaged with putting in trees. And finally, I spoke with Ped Ascarian from the community farm in the Chew Valley, um, which has been established for a number of years, but again came really into its own when supermarket supply chains were struggling in March um, and they were supplying local food to local people. So it's been incredibly inspiring. Thank you, Sarah. And I think what's been really interesting from just that, that very short recap, you know, how much people kind of get that climate emergency and doing their bit isn't just about you know what many would you know think of you know just don't drive anywhere it's actually it's much bigger it's much broader than that and it you know as you say with your conversations with Lorna from the repair cafe um you know there's a lot of other things you can do like I actually think you could I just fix this can I reuse this you know what happens um you know to our environment what about the wild you know the wildflowers and therefore the flora you know and fauna that is associated with that too and I'm really glad that you've also been taking that time to talk to our young people as well um, because I think sometimes our conversations as a council focus on quite a narrow range of, of people so I think that that's been fantastic to 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 hear about um, because at the end of the day you know we need to make sure people come with us to address the climate emergency we can't impose this on on uh, on our on our residents on um and actually that leads me quite neatly to uh, ask jane about the work the council's been doing um you know so as i said since may 2019 uh, we've been working on a variety of policies uh, and obviously you've also more recently been working on uh, a new sort of strand of work which is about green renewal and I just want you know could you just give us a bit of a flavour of the work that you've been doing on on all those issues please Jane. Yeah thank you Dina I'm very very pleased to do so. Um, so yes um, I, I've been leading on the, the council's um, climate emergency work and, um, and we've just set up a new work stream called um, the Renewal Vision, which I'm also leading on, which has um, green renewal of our economy at the heart of it. That's, that's, the, that's the point of it. Uh, and I think for those of you that are interested in this, this subject matter, you probably will have noticed that there have been an awful lot of experts out there, governors of the bank, you know, current and, and former governors of the Bank of England and, and many others saying that this that we have to use this opportunity, this, this, um, to, this recovery and renewal to make sure that we are doing it in as green a way as possible and pointing out that there are a multitude of opportunities to, 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 that will in, in make our community more resilient um, for the future and, and a, with a stronger, more robust, more diverse, greener local economy. So that's what the council is, is now um, really focusing on is how do the actions that we were planning to take anyway on the climate emergency help us to deliver that um, diverse um, and, and greener, more resilient local um, economy. So um, the um, work that we did last year, straight after we, we declared a climate emergency in which we reported to um, the o October Council, um, gave us a lot of information about the kind of actions that we need to take across Bath and North East Somerset and at the, the scale at which they need to be taken in order to deliver our objective, which is carbon neutrality across the whole district by, by 2030. And if you remember some of the headlines from that, um, it was things like, well, between now and 2030, we need to retrofit, that is make really energy efficient, um, about 65,000 of our existing homes. Now, you know, that actually represents an enormous green recovery opportunity. And that's one of the things that some of these um, economics experts have been saying is that, that actually, if you want to create jobs quickly and, and, um, and help local economies by having, giving people more money to spend, then actually this kind of a program is, is, is the quickest way to do it. Um, so um, there are other 
um, parts to, to, to there, are, there are other things that we need to do, like the increase the amount of renewable energy we've got. And we want to look at things like how do we build on the positive change that's happened, such as, you know, how do we make sure that we consolidate the increases in cycling and walking that reduce carbon emissions and enable people to, to work at home more because that's that's have, having a huge impact on um, reducing the need to, to travel, which is which is which is a real positive. And we want to look at strengthening local supply chains, for example, around food, because then that makes our it more resilient when these things happen, when we have terrible events like like COVID, but also it's what we need to to make ourselves resilient in the face of, of climate change, as I'm, as I'm sure many people um, know. So we're doing a piece of work at the moment that looks at all of those big numbers from the work that we did last year, the 65,000 homes, the 300 megawatts of, of renewable energy and so on, um, and some of these other, other um, aspects of, of, of what's happened recently that we want to build on, and saying, okay, what does that look like in terms of, of jobs and economic benefit and social benefit for people in Bath and North East Somerset? And that will, we will share that once we've got that information. We'll make it. We'll make it public um, to, to basically demonstrate you know, what are the what, what are the areas that, that will really help us to deliver um, a, a resilient um, and green um, recovery. And that what that work will do is inform um, a, um, a a big community conversation that that started with the the um, Sarah's climate conversations, but which we're going to expand now into a into a longer uh, program that covers all of these different issues that I've touched on and, and more besides, and that enables us to have a conversation um, at, across, kind of deeply and widely across our community. We want to reach, um, you know, we don't want to just talk to the, the, to the loudest voices. We need to hear from them as well, but we need to also reach those people that we don't hear from, um, as, as Dina was talking about, young people. So we're we working through um, all of our existing mechanisms um, that, that we have to communicate with people and democratic processes and so on, like the forums. But we'll also be looking at um, how can we reach people through different means, through frontline services, through their community organisations, so that we can really make sure we hear from everybody and that everybody is able to own a vision of the future that has green recovery um, um, at the heart of it. So I won't go into a lot of detail because that programme will unfold, but I'm hoping that that you and other people that you know and that you will encourage as many people as possible to get involved in webinars that we'll be promoting um, over the, the rest of the summer and into the autumn and a few other things that we're kind of got up our sleeve that we're designing at the moment to enable a big community conversation. Hmm. Thank you Jane and uh, so that leads quite neatly into uh, looking at some of these uh, questions that have already been sent in. What I'll do is I will work through the questions that have been sent in, but I'll also try and intersperse with some of the live questions as, as, they, as they come up uh, from, from our audience as well. So the first question I'd like to ask is from William Heath. And his question is, can we make sure Bath's green renewal is robustly multidisciplinary, i.e. that it draws on Bath's imagination and creativity, as well as its science, engineering, tech and entrepreneurship? Um, so, Jane, perhaps I could start with uh, you um, and, you know, give us, a, give us your yes. thoughts on that question. Well, it, it sort of follows directly on doesn't it from what I was just just saying at the end of my introduction and um, ab absolutely uh, that William that is definitely um, what we want to be doing we've set up a new um, uh, economic and community um, uh, recovery board um, which um, is starting to look at that and has um, a number of representatives across um, the universities for example are both represented in that um, mm -hmm. as well as the college and, and then a number of other kind of key players from 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 different sectors, business, uh, the creative industries and so on. So yes, you're absolutely right. We need to tap into the huge amount of, of talent and skills um, that we've got in Mark North East Somerset and, and get everybody contributing. Mm. And we've already seen some of that, I think from, you know, uh, prior to the pandemic, you know, we, we went, um, and I remember being in Canesham uh, and there were a number of parishes and, and town councils there who were sort of showcasing the work that they had done as well. So, you know, it's, yes, we can work with partners, but also that it's not the province of just us on our own, is it? It's, you know, everybody has a role to play in this. Um, so there was a related question from, from William, which is around how society uh, is now seriously divided 
and, and assumes that local politics is likely to get more vexed and tense in what may prove to be a savage recession. Uh, and how uh, will we deliver a green renewal vision that's built on a committed cross-party consensus where all parties get credit for any success? And I think, you know, I'd just like to pick up or make a start on answering that, which is, you know, quite clearly climate emergency and addressing that is not going to be down to one political party. It's going to be about everybody working together, you know, playing their part, doing their bit. Um, and as I, I said in my opening remarks, the climate emergency declaration was brought to council as a joint motion in 2019. And that was supported across the whole of the council chamber. And we will continue to work together with all parties and across the whole of the of the area. And when we talk about the whole of the region, we're not just talking about Bath and North and Somerset, we're also talking about those um, authorities that form uh, what's called WECA, so the West of England Combined Authority, which is Bristol, um, South Gloss, and also Bath and North East Somerset. Um, and obviously we, we won't stop at those borders either. We will have to, uh, and will indeed wish to, work with other authorities. Um, not just to ensure that we're all you know working towards the same ends but also to learn from good practice and um the the, the work that other places are doing because i don't think and i'm fairly sure jane and sarah would agree that we you know we may not know absolutely everything uh in order to to do the best that we possibly can i don't know sarah if you've got anything you'd like to add to that no, I mean, I'm really keen to work with uh, councillors from uh, all backgrounds and, you know, people of all parties and none. Hmm. Thank you, Sarah. OK, so uh, I'd like, like to ask a, a different question now, but on a similar sort of theme. So this is from Tim Williamson. And his question is, what will be the role for community organisations in the green renewal? So, Sarah, perhaps you'd like to start um, with your thoughts on that question. Thanks, Tim. I think that's a really good question. Um, uh, following on from the conversations I had with all those community organisations, um, I realise now just how absolutely vital um, community organisations are. In fact, I think, um, I don't know about other people's areas, but in my um, village uh, over coronavirus, I think even more community organisations have sprung up and come to the fore. And it's in times of adversity that we really see the community pulling together. So I think it's absolutely crucial that um, community organisations take the lead wherever they can. And if they need support from the council, we're really happy to facilitate that wherever we, where, wherever we can. Um, so that we will have consultation processes. So do look out for those around this renewal. So there'll be opportunities online. We've got an online tool we'll be using. And I hope we'll also be able to have some um, either gatherings or webinars where you can um, contribute in a much more, you know, um, live sort of a manner. Um, and so those opportunities will exist, look out for them and engage. Um, but really, I think these, um, I mean, especially in these straightened financial times for councils, um, there are limits to what the council can do. But actually, if all of us out in the community um, when we see an opportunity, we take it and we try to run with it. You know, as a council, we'll just try to facilitate that. Mm. Yeah, um, Jane, I wonder if you had uh, any extra points you wanted to raise. Yes, I, I, I think um, I think the thing is that actually we've got um, we've got a, a great history in Bath, North East Somerset that we can build upon. So, I mean, I know I know Tim and I know Energy Efficient Woodcombe, and we've worked with you in the past and. Energy Efficient Woodcombe is, is, is an amazing organisation that's done fantastic um, things, um, helping really vulnerable people um, to, to um, make their homes energy efficient and, and more besides. So, and, and obviously we're also the home of Bath and West Community Energy, which is one of the, it was the first community energy um, social enterprise that we, we supported the development of in, and, and that it, that's led a kind of the development of that kind of organisation across the country. So I would, I would say that, um, you know, we are we work with all of you and we will continue to work with all of you and we may well um and, and what we want to do is really um go a step further and and and, and connect people up more so that we, people are learning from each other so that we get more growth of that kind of action that those kinds of organizations have already been doing but we see that happening across more parishes and i know that's what 
you know, that we've got seven parishes who've declared a climate emergency so far, and I know that a number of them are now in conversation with Bath and West Community Energy, for example, about whether there are renewable energy, you know, community renewable energy project potential in their area. So we'll be looking at how we can really make sure that, that every community that wants to do something gets access to the, the best practice that, that we've got already um, in Bath, North East Somerset and support. Mm. Yes, and, and I think it's sort of really clear that it's not enough just to declare a, a climate emergency whether or not you're a, a parish or town council or um, a local authority council or a combined authority you've actually got to start thinking about what does that mean and who can you work with in order to deliver um you know measures that will truly help us reduce uh, our carbon emissions to to zero by by 2030. Um, the schools climate network actually was set up with exactly that in mind. It was for schools to um, each school would who wanted to participate would bring along, you know, examples of good practice that they they'd been undertaking so that they could pull them um, and um, and then others would be able to, you know, borrow ideas and, and, and everybody go in the same direction. And actually, I was speaking with um, people from a parish council on Friday and I realized they were a very proactive parish council I've spoken with other parish councils but because they're all doing different things I was saying to them well you know perhaps we can use our parish councils forum to as a as a method to you know pool pool ideas absolutely yes I mean I know it's been suggested that maybe there could be some sort of um repository of um you know great ideas that people can could easily access and you know and and take on us and you know develop as their own uh, that'll be some of what we'll some of those things we'll be able to do in our online tool um, and of course for parishes we have our parish council toolkit that we have um, published that gives people a few pointers in the right direction if they're starting out yes which is fantastic and uh, you know details of how to access uh, that toolkit will be uh, will accompany this this webinar uh, when when it is uh, put onto our youtube channel um so so next, my next sort of questions, and I think are going to be uh, about parish councils. Um, so Victoria Wells asked this question, which is, can parish councils be given education on green policy and inclusive environments for residents? I think this may be a, a reference to the toolkit, perhaps. Um, so Jane, maybe you could, um, perhaps is there anything else to, to add onto, onto the toolkit? Um. I, I mean, I think we've, we've pretty much covered it. I mean, we, the toolkit is is there on the council's website. If you go to the climate emergency button on the council's website, you'll be able to find um, the, the toolkit there. Um, and it's 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 got a lot in it. It's got a lot of information, but it's also got a lot of links to um, local organisations, but also to advice on, on how you can get support to do different things um, and um, best practice elsewhere, that kind of thing. And we'll be um, constantly um, reviewing that and updating it so that it's so that we keep we keep developing it and responding to you know if you tell us what we need what else you'd like to see on it then we'll do our best to try and um, make sure that that we get it up there um, so so that um, we get you the best possible support and advice through that um, I suppose the only other point to add is um, you know if in your area you you you're able to you're in the process of developing a neighborhood plan for example and have the wherewithal to do that locally no not all areas do then that's a great opportunity and there's some advice in the toolkit about how to do that hmm. thank you jane i'm just going to have a quick look at the the questions i've already can see a couple that i'm going to be put bringing in a little bit uh later on um so so another question then from victoria is uh, about residents and how they have a voice uh, in local green spaces before plans are imposed without public engagement or, or consultation. Uh, so Sarah, perhaps I could ask you to um, think about, you know, you know, whether or not, you know, how residents can, can be, uh, how they can have their voices heard. I mean, I think there'll, there'll be processes, whether it's development of neighbourhood plans in your area um, or, you know, there are council consultations around parks and so on. I mean, as an administration, we've been elected very much on a platform of improving public engagement. Um, so I think where there are significant developments locally, we as an administration will be very keen to see um, a proactive process of public engagement. And, you know, if, if we're failing to do that, we need feedback to that effect as well. Um, and uh, it, it where it comes down to parish councils, I guess it will be about, you know, 
working through the parish councils forum to encourage them to think in those terms as well. And just to add to that, Sarah, um, we are in the process of uh, refreshing our, our local plan. Uh, so there may be some, some scope for um, residents uh, to have their say in that, particularly around green spaces. Uh, but there will also be, um, we'll also then be moving to writing a new local plan uh, alongside developing the, the region's spatial development uh, scheme as well. And so I would urge all residents to get involved uh, and put their views into that too. Um, so whilst we're still talking about green spaces, I had a further question from Victoria, which is about um, whether Baines would make all green space accessible for inclusive environments uh, to improve physical and mental health especially creating policy for the future? I, I think we will be keen to do that. And uh, I think we'll be keen to engage with you, Victoria, to find out whether there are you know, things we can and should be incorporating into, uh, into our local plan, into any of other, our other policies that um, would point us in the right direction. Hmm. Absolutely, yes. You know, and I, as I would say to anybody, if you um, have some concerns or some issues, please let us know because we can't um, address them if we don't know what, the, what they are. So please keep, keep us in, informed. Um, okay, so I'm now going to move on to planning, which I think leads relatively well from when we've been talking about the local plan. Uh, so a question from Julian Hannam, and I note on, on the uh, live questions, I've got a number of similar questions in this. So I'm going to start with Julian's question first, which is, a part of the green renewal, which the council is considering, so I think this should be as part of the green renewal, which the council is considering, will the planning department in future be requiring all new buildings, whether housing or commercial, to incorporate low carbon building materials and also include all current methods of power generation, energy saving, use of grey water and using all modern technologies with the aim of gradually moving towards zero carbon buildings. Um, now, Sarah, I know you've got a particular interest in this, so I'm going to ask you to, to start off on this one. Well, I mean, as a council, we're really fortunate, actually, because we still have a sustainability team, whereas many of those councils who, um, who've declared climate emergencies, in fact, you know, through, through the many years of uh, cuts to council budgets, had lost any expertise they had. So we have quite a bit of expertise in this area, and we're currently um, undergoing a um, local plan review um, and we are very keen to incorporate as much of all those ideas as we possibly can. Um, so both the sustainability team and I have had the opportunity to feed into the um, re review of the local plan and we are, we're pushing for as much of that as possible. So, I mean, as part of the climate emergency, our analysis that went to the October council meeting um, as essentially said that we have to be build zero carbon uh, going forward um, as far as we possibly can. And so we are pushing all that as far as we can. Um, the thing that lots of members of the public, I think, probably don't know is that we are subject to the national planning policy framework. Um, and any local plan that we put together has to be assessed by a government inspector who will decide whether it is a viable plan for development. So it may be that what we want to do, our aspirations go beyond what that inspector will allow us to do. Um, so as a council and as an administration, what we very much want to do is to insist upon zero carbon, but we, our hands may be tied in that way and we may have to row back, back from that somewhat, but we will continue to push that as hard as we can. So that leads um, to a question from Nicolette, Nicolette Bota, which is, I think, picks up on uh, a speech that was made by the Prime Minister uh, in the last week or so. Um, and her question is, how will the Cabinet deliver its vision of a green community-based uh, renewal with its reliance on new economic and business models, given that national government are pursuing economic growth, regional government green growth, and the paucity of appropriate alternative metrics for measuring your success? Uh, and I think there was a similar question, which was, um, actually, it's not similar enough. I'll let you have that question first. <laughs> is it to me? Oh, yes. Sorry, Sarah. Yes, it is. 
So uh, uh, that's obviously a huge challenge. Uh, well, you know, when the agenda of the national government is is somewhat different in direction from ours, um, it's a challenge. But I think it will be about um, finding where there's crossover or finding opportunities where money comes forward, finding opportunities to take that money and to use it in a direction you know that that, that suits us. So, um, for example, if money is made available to the highways agency. Well, it may be that we could take some of that money and use it to make um, make stretches of the highway that come through Baines um, more sustainable. Um, so we'll just have to, you know, every opportunity, every every possible pot of money that we hear of, we, we will try to adapt it to a sustainability ag agenda. And, and Jane, as somebody who actually ends up having to write the policies, um, it would be useful to hear from you. Well, um, what I wanted to, to add to that is that um, we've been doing a, an awful lot of work um, behind the scenes for, for a long time, working with um, other local authorities across the West of England, but also across the whole country, actually, where, um, on how to respond to the climate emergency and working on together um, with, a, with some think tanks in, in, in London and um, the LGA and, and, and people that local government association. We've been working on what are the things that local government needs from central government in order to deliver on the climate emergency and the ecological emergency and now on the on the on the green renewal. So um, so um, so Dina, for example, was at a, at a great meeting um, a, a week last week of the leaders and mayors uh, across all the combined authority areas in which um, you you discuss what are the priorities that you wanted to you know. So that let, there's, a, there's a letter now going, isn't there, that we're a we're a part of so we're doing as much as we can to to get the message across to central government about what we need and how important things like retrofitting is and renewable energy um to, to try and get that 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 focus and to get the support that we need um to make it happen and we're working with as many other local authorities as we possibly can to strengthen our, our argument on that so I think that's worth people knowing about yes um thank you and uh, i know sarah was talking about roads and um, perhaps you know, using other modes of, of transport. So Stephen Gerling asked a question, which is what more can be done to actively promote cycling around our city to promote electric bikes, given how hilly the city is, this is vital, and to prioritize vehicular access to the city for those who are disabled or less able. I would think it'd be useful as well to take your comments on this um, to outside the city as well, because obviously we are a council that's made up of both the city of Bath, but also North East Somerset too. And I would imagine that, um, you know, one solution might not be uh, right for, for both areas. So perhaps Sarah. I think um, these transport issues will be picked up in much more detail in a forthcoming webinar um, later this month. Um, but just to say, I mean, you know, we are, aware of that challenge and once again you know we are um, looking out for every available pot of money that we can adapt to you know helping people to buy e-bikes and um, a lot of our transport um, uh, strategy is focused around uh, low traffic neighborhoods and around creating um, more space for cycling and walking. Um, Jane would you like to add something? No no I think that's you've covered it. Okay, I'm going to go back to uh, the point that I was making from the, the Prime Minister's speech, uh, which is uh, from um, Eileen Cameron. Uh, so retro house, retrofitting houses is great, but how can you ensure that new houses are built to zero energy standards, given the government is intending to further reduce planning regulations on, on housing? So I know you've answered some of this already, Sarah. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to or, or maybe Jane would like to come in yeah I mean I, I all I all I can say I mean this is you know you, you've, you've pointed up a, a difficulty no there's no doubt but um what we've, what we've been doing in the west of England the four local authorities that make up the west of England the planning and sustainability officers have been working together for several years now on um building as a, as robust as possible an evidence base for our area um, to to um, to sit behind um, that that zero carbon policy that that um, yeah zero carbon uh, building policy that we want to get into the local plan as, as Sarah Sarah was talking so you I mean please be assured we're doing everything we can to try and get the best possible policy 
um, um, in the. Um, Okay, so uh, and I just wanted just to go back to Nicolette's question that we, um, you know, we did speak of uh, before, and I just wondered about the whether you've had any thoughts about how we measure success. You know, are there any sort of metrics that you uh, think might be um, appropriate to use, Jane? Um. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to have another conversation with Nicolette because I know she's got really, really good I ideas on this. But I mean, I mean, the sort of thing I think that, you know, based on the actions that we know need to be taken here um, is, you know, we need to be measuring um, you know, how many homes are actually being retrofitted. We need to be measuring how much renewable energy are we actually getting out there because we know how much more we need now. We know how many homes we need to to, to um, make energy efficient. So, I mean, those kinds of measures that are the things that we'll be looking at locally. Um, as we as we develop our action plan on climate emergency, more actions will come through and we'll be making sure that we've got good performance measures against all of those. So um, that's that's my initial thoughts on it. But we, it'd be good to have a further conversation if you've got more ideas for us to look at. Hmm. And then I'd just uh, like to bring in Catherine Piper, uh, uh, her question into this, which is about is the local authority ambitious enough? Um, and so she says, Recent statistics revealed that despite the lockdown, we will not have met the level of carbon emission reductions that we need to make uh, to meet our 2050 1.5 uh, centigrade target, let alone moving this to 2030. Uh, we require over 7% of reductions in emissions year on year. This year, the prediction is that we will have emission reductions uh, by between 4 to 7%, despite everything practically coming to a standstill for months. So do you think that this has been, sorry, do you feel that this has been fully grasped by both the local authority and the general public? Um, I think this authority probably has grasped that, but I don't know whether you would uh, entirely agree with that, uh, Jane, and, and obviously it would be useful to hear what, uh, you know, if the public fully um, get that too. Um, I think that, the, I, I, think the local, I think the local authority has, and I think lots of local authorities um, have actually, and, and, and that's why we're all trying to work together to get what we need from central government in terms of, of, of support and, and powers to, take more action locally faster. Um, so that's what we, we're we already trying to do. And I think um, it's worth just mentioning that um, of the, um, I think it's 80% of, of, of local authorities in the UK have declared a climate emergency, but only some of them have actually declared it for their whole district rather than just for their own operations. And we're one, so we're in the top third of local authorities who've, who, who've said, no, this isn't just about what we do, it is about the whole community and how we provide the leadership and enable everybody to take to take action so I think yeah we we, we, we understand um, the reality um, of it what was the second part of the question you asked me Dina you asked me something else I was going to say something else I forgot what it was <laughs> okay uh, it was about uh, whether the the general public have um, okay fully this too um I think yeah, well we 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 don't know but I mean what we do know is that um, I mean we, we saw protests outside the Guildhall that we'd, on the scale of which we'd never seen before and, and people coming in to talk to council meetings last year in, in a very articulate fashion and, and really understanding it. So there, is, there are definitely lots of people in our community who really do get it and who want us to take um, that more radical action. That much is, is really clear. But I think the real challenge is, is how do you engage um, people across the entire community? And that, that is the challenge we have given to ourselves and, and that Sarah and, and, and Dean and the rest of the cabinet are really, um, you know, we, we, we've talked a lot about this, but how do we reach everybody? And I think that the, the, the approach that we want to take is to really um, go to where people are and understand where they are and what their concerns are and help them to understand how some of the actions that we need to take can help them. So that, that's what I mean about, um, you know, retrofitting uh, existing housing making it energy efficient has never been a particularly you know, exciting or sexy thing to do but it's actually really really good for our local economy and, if, and it's really good for tradespeople who may have lost business recently um, it's easy to convert construction skills from the, the big construction stuff that may not be happening to retrofitting so there's lots of ways in which we need to I think communicate the benefits of, of the things that we need to do on the climate emergency and actually one of the things that we will be using as part of the um, 
engagement program as we roll it out is um, a toolkit that we um, actually contributed to the development of that's been um, produced for local authorities to use um, called the co-benefits toolkit and it's a it's a really a great piece of work that looks through every sort of action that you need to take across all aspects of, of it, including the, not just the, the, the obvious big ones around our climate, but right the way through all the um, ecological emergency actions that we need to take. And um, you know what it gives, it gives you a way of, of analyzing the kind of cost of those against the benefits that you get for your community, whether it's economic benefits or some of these, uh, these things that we've been talking about around making you know a community a village more more sustainable by having you know a local shop there having access to to local food all of those kinds of things so i think we'll be trying to use that toolkit to help stimulate that conversation with with people in the community so that they can start to feel more connected to what climate action means for them um, and that it's not just some kind of something that, that affects other people's lives and, and isn't relevant to them or, or which they well, some people I think may see it as, 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 as negative and I think we've got to really tell the story about what the positives are and what the benefits are um, to, to everyone. So do you think there's more that we as a council can do to try and uh, demystify and make it simpler for ordinary residents to uh, get what benefits there are to because I would you know, well, I, I don't imagine. I know that there are many people who, uh, you know, might want to do something but think it is either too complicated or too expensive to 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 even think about at this moment in in time. You know, particularly when people are worried about losing their jobs. Um, you know, so is, is there more that you think we could be doing and and should be doing? Uh, yeah, de definitely, and I, and I think it's a, it's a challenge for for all local authorities who who you know we've we've had to quickly um, move on this, and I and I think that there's there's a lot of help out there now, and I think we could I, I'm 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 pretty confident that we can st stimulate more of that kind of conversation, and it, particularly the more positive ones um, around the, the developing a, a vision for the area that people that really comes from where people are at wherever they are in in, in in the city centre of Bath or um, in, in one of the villages out in the rural areas to, to see the benefits for them. So we've got some really good stories in Bath and Lockley, Somerset that don't always, you know, we've, we've tried to tell them, I think we could get more, we could tell them again around, for example, the benefits that um, a community owned uh, solar farm has. Um, so I, one of the best ones is um, uh, out in, in the, the, the Chew Valley area where you know a, a community wanted to, um, put put out a share offer to get people to contribute to them building a, a solar farm. Uh, they got help from Bath and West Community Energy to do that, and then um, the the what the community have decided to do because they basically put money into it, and now they get a return on that investment through the power that they sell from their solar farm. And my understanding was this is a, a while back, so they they may have done something different with it now. But the money that they certainly the first money that they were getting the return on investment they were reinvesting back into the community into rural broadband for example so i think it's that kind of you know understanding how if we could take more local action we could get more local benefit like that um i'm sure that, i'm sure i'm sure lots of people in the audience have probably got some other stories that we could be um telling so um Oh, absolutely. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting. So one of the questions that's come from the audience from Jackie Head is what support can we give to local rural communities who want to encourage behaviour change to support people living more sustainably? Um, so perhaps, Sarah, you might have some ideas on, on this one. Um, I think, well, I was, um, uh, as uh, Jackie knows, I've been talking with people in the rural communities and the last week or so I mean it's it's a real particularly the travel conundrum is a real challenge for them isn't it um, and it's something I'm trying to that's something in particular that I'm trying to engage with um, people in rural areas about at the moment actually so if anyone's got ideas um, please feel free to send them in um, um, yes absolutely I think I mean I think that one of the things I've noticed about rural communities is that they have tend to have a natural sense of community already about them particularly if they're very um isolated people people naturally gravitate towards each other and have relationships anyway po probably in a way that a suburb suburb of bath doesn't um uh, but absolutely i mean i think there may be things that the parishes can do themselves by you know working with other parishes from other places and borrowing their ideas as we've already said um 
I'm not sure what other sorts of, commu uh, of, of support networks um, you want or need, but please tell us. Hmm. So um, Jane, I don't know if um, you've already picked up on uh, other uh, wants, you know, other um, support that uh, that rural communities would need. Um, well, I, I, to, to tell you the truth, I think we're at the beginning of the process. So we we went round the community forums um, and um, earlier in the year. Um, I'm going to go and we're, we're, we're talking, I think Sarah and I are both going to the um, parish liaison meeting later on this week to 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 talk more about you know, what we're doing on, on this and, and you know, what parishes need in terms of, of help, because um, it's a few months since since we spoke to them. And I think um, I think what we what we can do is um, in the because um, we're, we're still developing this program. We have, you know, so it's really good to have this conversation now is I think we could look at um, running some of our web webinars specifically around the challenges that you have in rural areas because they're different from the ones in the, in the, in the city or all or, or the towns. Um, and, to, and so that we can really understand that and understand what then what support we might be able to, to give you or where there might be examples from other parts of the country that we could um, put you in touch with. So we'll have a look at that and see what more we can do. I mean, it does. I have been thinking that there may be some principles for rural communities that we could probably um, adopt. So about saying that, you know, communities should, as far as we can bring it about, they should be complete. They should have um, shops that sell their, um, um, uh, you know, sell their essentials. They should have um, good broadband and they should have probably nowadays in coronavirus times, they probably should have a shared workspace where people can go out from their houses but don't have to commute all the way to Bath or Bristol and just to sit with some other people and do their work. So perhaps those are the things we ought to be aspiring to. Um, but then the challenge as a council is to work out what levers we have that we can pull that try to influence some of that. Hmm. So one of the questions that has come up a few times is around the ecological or nature uh, emergency. I know, Sarah, you've referred to it um in in some of your your answers i wonder is there more that you could say at this time about why you think uh addressing the emergency is is um really important um yes i mean so hopefully those questioners will be happy to learn that we um well um subject to um uh, everyone voting for it or enough people voting for it we will be we intend to be declaring an ecological emergency as a council this month um as bristol did six months ago so i mean we already recognized nature when we originally um uh declared a climate emergency but now we want to recognize ecology in its own right um and i think that's key because um I suppose the climate emergency was inspired in part by the, um, oh, my mind's gone blank, um, the report um, from the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on the differences between one and a half and two degrees. Um, but another important report came out last year, um, the IPBES report, which is around the um, reduction in biodiversity, the um, uh, damage to ecological systems um, and the fact that we are in fact in the beginning of a sixth extinction event and um, this you know even if we could wave a magic wand tomorrow and resolve the climate emergency it wouldn't resolve the ecological emergency because there are other causes to that as well and it is just as serious for us so um, really we felt that that needs a recognition in its own right and, and this is the time to do it. Mm. So I was just going to leave a pause there, Jane, in case you wanted to come in. Um, well, I suppose uh, yes, I, there, there is something I could add um, on, on that definitely. As as um, as Sarah said, you know, we we have um, been looking at we've been working looking at both the climate and nature emergency together because they're they're basically you know, opposite sides of the of the same coin in terms of of the of the environment as a whole. Um, but I think one little thing that might just be worth adding is that in that um, piece of research I mentioned at the beginning of the analysis that we're doing around um, what are the green recovery um, opportunities for the action that we need to take. Um, I, what I didn't mention on my list, but it is on my list, is, is looking at the nature-based solutions um, that we need, need in terms of um, tree planting, flood defense, um, increasing biodiversity, um, because there are, there are economic benefits to our communities in that work as well, and that activity. Um, 
So I think, we, again, it's, it's another angle that we need to, to develop um, uh, uh, our um, arguments around and, and, and in our ability to engage people, I think. Um, uh, so we'll be having a look at that um, as well. Hmm. And uh, so one of the very visible ways that we can demonstrate, I guess, our commitment to the climate emergency is, is around um, not building, planting, planting more trees. Um, and a question that's been asked by Adam Gretton, uh, who is from More Trees for Bath and North East Somerset, is actually around, you know, what is our commitment to this? Uh, his question is, what budget is set aside for hitting the tree planting target? And has this been a, a impacted by COVID-19? Um, shall I take that one? Yes, please, Sarah. Um, so the good news is that it hasn't been impacted by COVID-19. We've managed to hang on to the new budget we've set aside in February for this work, um, which is a happy situation. So the council intends to plant 100,000 trees in the next three years. And um, the budget that's set aside, uh, I believe is 100,000 pounds. And that encompasses some of that, uh, that's for a year, I think, per year. Is that right? I can't believe so. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, some of that money is towards uh, actually planting the trees, and some of that will be about employing staff to ensure that we have a strategy. Because um, uh, I suppose this is one of those areas where people think, oh, it's very simple, just go and plant a tree. But in fact, um, um, people who work in this field have a phrase right tree right place um, we need to make sure that we have a strategy that identifies the right locations the right species of tree to put them there otherwise the trees simply won't survive into adulthood um, because they won't be happy or because people won't want them in that place so um, so it's really important that we have a strategy and we do it right so the money encompasses both drafting a strategy and um, planting some trees Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm just quickly going through some of the other questions to see if there's anything else that um, would... Well, I suppose this is another one. This, this goes back a little bit, I guess, to, you know, rural areas. Uh, and it's about public rights of way. And I don't know who sent in this question, but it's about uh, whether bridle paths and footpaths will be reviewed as part of active travel. Hmm. So I don't know, Jane, is that something that's on your radar already? Uh, not something I know about, but we can um, we can we can check the relevant team and, and, mm. and find out. Oh, what absolutely. I would say is that we have a consultation out at the moment um, on Commonplace, which we can post the link to with the vi video of this. Um, which so if you're aware of issues, improvements, for example, that could be made in some of those areas, if you are aware of bridle paths or footpaths that could be changed or upgraded, um, then do by all means go and stick a pin in the map on the commonplace uh, consultation to say that. So that consultation is about improving opportunities for active travel for walking and cycling around Bath and North East Somerset. Thank you. That's a really, um, really important that people do uh, you know, say where where they um, you know those areas that they they, they want to be improved uh, as well. Um, so another just uh, another sort of a bit of a slightly ad hoc question here is about uh, the keep bees buzzing. So I think um, across Bath and North East Somerset, I'm sure many of us will have seen these signs uh, that have been cropping up uh, in areas where you know, we've got more wildflowers growing. Um, and we've had to put in signs to say that these areas are being managed in a different way so that they are more attractive to insects and to, to bees as well. Um, if somebody wants a site near them, how should they go about it, Jane? Um, the honest answer is I, I don't know. I don't know enough about that, but um, I think um, we can get back to you on that one with with uh, with where where you need to go to register that. Oh, someone's answered it. Just contact Bath Beekeepers. It says here um, <laughs> uh, from William Heath. Um, if you if you want the council to stop cutting it, and if you want uh, the signs from the council, probably I don't know. You could begin by uh, flagging it on Council Connect or writing to your yeah. Local. yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Let us know. Um, probably as, as Sarah says, uh, put it uh, through Council Connect in, in the first instance, but or, or else through your own um, local councillor as well. Or if you want more bees um, and want to keep bees, 
then as, as William suggests, uh, contact the, the uh, beekeeping, um, uh, local beekeeping society. Right, um, so I've got a few more questions and I think we should have uh, just about enough time to address. Uh, and so this has come up a, a little bit throughout uh, this conversation and it's about um, addressing inequality. And as William Heath was so kind in giving us an answer to the last question, um, I feel that we, we should uh, make a start on, on answering this question. Um, so Jane, how can we make um, addressing inequality a priority in our green vision? Um, well, the first thing that we need to do, which, which I mentioned earlier, is, is make sure that in our, in our big conversation that, we, we, that we're, we're, we're planning to roll out, that we um, reach um, people who we, who we wouldn't normally reach and who have difficulty normally engaging with this kind of thing. So we'll be talking to frontline services and, and uh, third sector organisations to, to make sure that we do that. So that's, that's number one. But I think um, what I would direct you towards is um, we're, we have, as a council, we're very serious about the just transition. Um, and um, we did a piece of work last year, which was um, a report that we attached to our council report in October um, that looked at, um, that analysed some aspects of carbon emissions across um, in different income brackets across our, um, our district. So if you want the detail, I recommend you go to our climate emergency button on the website and you'll, you'll be able to, to, to find that, um, that report on, on carbon emissions um, based on um, different income um, brackets. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's complicated and what we'll need to do is, is, but we will make sure that we will build on that work when we, as we're coming up with actions that the council takes or that we're working with others in partnership to enable across the community to make sure that it is, that it is fair. In, um, and that, um, I mean, one of the first things, for example, is to make sure that um, any scheme that looks at um, home energy retrofitting really does target those on the lowest incomes because they're the ones that are actually paying the most for their energy now, but uh, have the least carbon emissions. So that will always inform how we um, design our, um, our, our, our programmes of work. Um, mm. And I think, you know, access to webinars like this, you know, is also something we need to think about because there are many who you know, are able to access uh, these conversations, but there are many who can't. So we need to be thinking about how do we engage with those people as well, because their voices are equally as important as as um, as everyone else's. So, you know, we just need to be conscious of that and to work with everybody in a variety of different um, ways. You know, and, and I think that that um, that would apply, though, to a many other areas of inequality as well you know like health and well-being digital which is sort of what I mentioned uh I, you know and even sort of perhaps uh, you know black lives matter and, and you know a range of other areas where it's quite clear that um there are still some marked inequalities that we in the positions that we hold in in the council and also with our other partners and agencies that are working in this area too, need to be working proactively to, to try and address. Sarah. Me on inequalities? Um, yes, please, thank you. Yes, absolutely. To, um, yeah, maybe you want to, 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 one... um, to reiterate that I think it's really important that we have a, a, a socially just transition and that that is a a priority for us and we have data as um, Jane has said that is pointing us in the direction of and has shown us that um, for some of our more affluent households emit far more than um, some of our less affluent households. Um. And, and I guess the other piece of this is a well is around food production and I know that's been there is certainly a, uh, a thought out there that if you want you know sort of uh, you know locally produced food that it's going to cost you more and you know I think during the coronavirus pandemic that hasn't that's been proven to not always be the case so I mean how can we better publicize and support those producers um, who you know are able to produce you know lower cost food locally 
I, I think it's going to be a really important strand of the green renewal will be around um, shortening uh, supply chains and providing outlets for some of our local producers, um, you know, within Bath and North East Somerset. So I um, mean, it's early days and we have yet to work out how we how we approach that, but I think that will be crucial and that will be part of um, creating a more resilient society going forward so that should another um, disaster befall us, which um, sadly, you know, the climate emergency and the ecological emergency suggest is likely at some point, we will be in a better position and uh, we won't have this issue of uh, empty supermarket shelves um, if our supply chains are a bit shorter and more simple. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's a really important issue that will benefit local business and um, benefit the community as well. And I suppose if we can get those, those routes right, um, and I suppose one of the advantages to do it, to supplying food very locally is perhaps you'll be cutting out you know, the middleman in the chain and so there may be um, opportunities to make economies in that way. Hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Um, unfortunately, we've absolutely run out of time now. So I was just going to ask if, um, if my two panelists had any final words they wanted to uh, add at this point. Um, so I'll ask Jane if you've got any any concluding remarks. Well, um, just I, I think just to say that um, you know we, we're keen to hear people's ideas. We're keen to find what you know develop ways that engage more people than than ever before, um, so that we can hear all of those um, voices. So um, you know, do let us have those those ideas, but also um, do encourage others to tune in. So as, as Sarah mentioned earlier, our next webinar. It's on the 27th of July and it's around the um, livable neighbourhoods and, and sustainable travel um, and then we'll have we'll have more that we'll be promoting um, so so watch this space um, and um, you know if you've got ideas for webinars that you think it'd be a good idea for us to run then let us know as well. Absolutely thank you Jane and Sarah? Yeah I would say yes we're very absolutely committed to working with the public and with business and you know with potential businesses as well very keen to hear from everybody and um, totally committed to a socially just and green renewal um, from coronavirus so if you've got ideas just please send them in and we want to hear from you. Absolutely yes because um, one of our key um, one of the key things that we wanted to do as an administration was have a proper conversation on on issues that really matter to our communities and that's a when i say conversation i mean that's a two-way stream of conversation we don't know all the answers so please you know if you've got thoughts if you've got ideas if you've got some solutions then please let us know and we'll be very happy to to listen and you know maybe uh continue um a further conversation on those um on those issues so can i say thank you to both my panelists for joining me uh, this afternoon. I'd like to say thank you also to all those that have um, uh, been in, in the webinar itself, all those that are watching live on YouTube and those uh, that will be watching um, the, the recorded um, YouTube, um, uh, I was going to say show, but you know, the, the recorded, the recording. Um, and, and finally, I'd like to say thank you very much to the team who have We've been working behind the scenes to make sure this event runs really smoothly. So thank you, everybody. I'm sorry if we haven't been able to answer your question, and we will endeavour to get the questioners' uh, answers to their questions as, as soon as we possibly can. So thank you very much for watching, and um, hopefully we'll see you again at another webinar.